I, I just want to say thanks. It's a great honour to be invited here, and I'd like to just say congratulations to <coughs> the uh, Alchemist Cafe team for putting together a really fantastic set of events. I went to my first recently, and I thought it was a great venue. I hope you still think so after tonight. So I'm going to um, st I'm going to talk about three things tonight. Let's give you the three uh, titles of my three ten-minute pitches to you. Uh, the first one is entitled Genetic Pessimism. The second one is entitled 10,000 Hours. And the third one is entitled Brain Capacity. So I'm going to start off the first one, Genetic Pessimism, with a question to you all, which you don't have to answer, but uh, if you could, I'd be glad. So how many of you would answer yes to the following question? You have a certain amount of intelligence, and you can't really do much to change it. Who would say yes to that? Don't believe you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, somewhere. OK. Um, uh, so most of you, okay, that's very interesting. That would be a very different response. Maybe I, I suspect you get a different response in some parts of the world. So that's a very uh, optimistic uh, <laughs> statement. I wish I thought uh, there's a few more questions in this um, uh, questionnaire. I only wrote down one of them, but never mind. Never mind. Um, uh, so, so most of you then believe, don't believe it is the case that you have a certain amount of intelligence and you can't really do much to change it. Now, the reason I'm disappointed, so a small number of brave people at the back there agreed with that question. But that would be a <clears throat> very strongly prevailing um, belief in certainly in a large number of circles in psychology, academic psychology, and in, it has been quite a strongly prevalent belief among a good number of policymakers in various countries over the years. So, so what I want to argue in the first part of my talk tonight is that um, pessimistic beliefs about the biological determinants of our capacities, our emotions, and our behaviors can be self-fulfilling prophecies. Um, and I want to just give you a few uh, examples of evidence that this is the case. So there's a, a researcher in Stanford University, Carl uh, Dweck, who has developed a very interesting approach to beliefs such as that. Uh, and she studies children and asks them questions like that about the extent to what they uh, attribute their capacities, usually their intellectual capacities. Um, and she can grade children and adults as well on a scale of the extent to which they believe whatever the capacity they're talking about is, if you like, preordained by their genes or their biology or whatever, versus those who believe it's more malleable. And uh, she just recently published a, a paper with uh, Lisa Blackwell from Columbia University, where they measured such beliefs, if you like, fatalistic beliefs, if you like, uh, about intellectual ability in uh, a group of seventh grade children in the States, that would be children just about 13 going into first year of secondary school. And then she followed them up over four years <clears throat> and she found that irrespective of actual ability, the ones who did not subscribe to fatalistic, pessimistic beliefs showed a steady increment in their mathematical ability over the four years while those who subscribed to the, if you like, the pessimistic, predetermined view of their abilities, they showed level peg. They didn't show improvement. So that's the first piece of evidence I'd like to give you about our beliefs about our capacities fulfilling themselves. So the second one is um, uh, various research on uh, people at all ages, you can measure something called um, 
locus of control in psychology. That is, you can quite reliably measure the extent to which people feel in control over their lives versus the extent to which they feel that their uh, lives are under the control over external factors that they don't have any control over. And across uh, all ages, not just older people, across all ages, uh, Windsor and their colleagues found that people who believe they're in control of their own lives show higher cognitive function, higher mental abilities than those who feel less in control. And uh, in a recent study, uh, Jane Wardle, a former colleague of mine in, in London, a um, study of several thousand people in Central East Europe, where there tend to be quite high levels of feelings of loss of control and uh, low life satisfaction since the, the fall of the, uh, <coughs> the collapse of the Cold War. Um, they, she found, uh, and her colleagues found, that uh, depression and low life satisfaction were associated with low perceived control and with the beliefs that of the influence of chance, of fate, over health. Okay. And uh, finally, over an, there was an 18-year study of people in their early 60s, and they followed them up over 18 years, large number, about 700 of them, and they found that uh, those who believed, felt in control, and had positive attitudes towards aging showed much better health 18 years later than those who felt, if you like, the victims of circumstance and chance and biology. So my argument tonight is that our own theories about what determines our mental functions but perhaps not only our mental functions, perhaps our emotional functions as well, our own theories about that actually shape how well these functions will emerge. Now, I'm going to fo focus tonight on cognitive and intellectual uh, functions, but I want to make one thing clear. Uh, I'm not saying that there are no genetic or biological influences on our behavior. Clearly there are, and there are limits to all of this. You cannot stop or prevent Alzheimer's disease. Uh, uh, you cannot um, override uh, disability, intellectual disability that you've had since birth. But there is a very big leeway to play with when it comes to cognitive functions. And that leeway is affected by your own beliefs about whether there, there is leeway or not. So let me just elaborate on that a little bit. And, um, we now know there's far fewer genes in the human genome than we previously thought. I say we, I'm not a geneticist, but there's 30,000 genes in the human genome approximately. That is not nearly enough to code for all the different varieties of behavior, the emotions, the thoughts, the different varieties of human human behavior. Uh, the, the, the Nobel Prize winner Gerald Edelman has concluded and sh shown reasonably convincingly that every single human brain is totally unique. And it's totally unique because of its complexity and its interactions with many different environments. There are as many different brains as there are different environments combining with different genomes. So. Almost all our genes that are important for our behavior have evolved to interact with the environment. 